You've probably never seen an election like this unless you remember 2000. <laughs> and uh, let's hope we don't go there. But one of the things that, um, is this not working here? I got it helps if I get it the right direction. Everybody tries to, every four years, to try and look back at the prior election and analyze everything in that same vein. Absolutely, and let me move here if I'm in the way, it does not work in Florida. Florida is too much of a state that changes constantly. And I just put up a couple reasons here why 2012 is nowhere near like it was in 2008. And of course, demographically, we picked up two congressional seats, which means that we are even more powerful on the political stage than we were four years ago. Campaign finance laws, everybody's heard of super PACs. Uh, super packing is now a verb. It's very disturbing to a lot of people. It's torrents of money just pouring down into races by a few very uh, wealthy donors. And a lot of people say it's, it's really making our system far less representative. Redistricting ads. Media habits, I have to ask you. How many of you had an iPhone four years ago? Raise your hands. That's more than usual. How many of you have one now or the equivalent? There you go. So even communication itself has changed dramatically. But nothing has changed more than the cynical mood of the electorate. Why? Because when we have economic downturns in this country, people get really very angry at government for a lot of different reasons. And I, what I'm going to do is to show you some of the major slides that we uh, that show exactly why the election is where it is right now. How do I do this? I have to keep up with the polls every single day. I hire students to put my graphics together for me. I constantly update every day that I give a presentation has the most current data available because things are happening so fast right now. You can't just wait till the weekend to read the paper or whatever to really know what's going on. In fact, uh, you might have, if you don't know, uh, Mr. Romney is coming to Land Lakes High School. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a Pasco County resident. And of course, the president's coming tomorrow. Think about it. Three, this is the fourth time this year already that we've had one of each of the candidates from each ticket in the Tampa Bay media market on the same day or a couple days apart. This is the most important part of Florida that you're sitting in. You have the 50-yard line seat in politics right now. <laughs> and let me just back up a step. Yesterday, I was the guest of Lynn University. They invited three scholars from around the country to come down and participate in post-debate activities on the campus and in the community. And I was in a classroom, and a gentleman came in, and he was talking about we, I had just started talking about the importance of Florida. He came in and he said, it's not as important as New York. I said, excuse me? Well, I, they have many more electoral college votes than us. And you'll notice here, 29 in Florida, 29 in New York. The students loved it, honestly. So it was really fun. I love that kind of teaching, too. <laughs> Uh, of course, let me go the right way here. But a lot of people don't realize, what is it about Florida that makes us so very, very special? And one is that, and this is very true too, Hillsborough County is the best bellwether county for all of Florida and Florida for the nation in terms of some things that we take for granted. One is our racial and ethnic makeup in Florida looks more like the country's racial and ethnic makeup when it comes to Latinos, African Americans, and also Anglos. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of focus group work is done here. Many of those ads that you find terrible on television actually had a lot of testing here before they went national, not just Florida. The three key political geographies right now are really coming into play. I did some interviews today. Why is Romney going to Pensacola? Why is Obama coming here? The three key geographies are things that you use when you're trying to decide in the last days of getting out the vote where you send your candidates. In Florida, rural areas tend to have much higher turnout. Much of the rural areas in the North Florida panhandle are very conservative. Uh, they're registered Democrat. They don't vote that way, but they are very, very high turnout voters. If you look on election day and you align the 67 counties in Florida, the, the highest turnout would consistently be in the rural areas. Jeb Bush was one of the first candidates, and now even Democrats follow his roadmap of figuring out that you could make up in rural areas with higher turnout some votes that you might lose in urban areas. 
Urban areas are home to most of the younger voters, more Democrats, more racial and ethnic minor minorities, and of course a key part of the Democratic base. Which brings us to the one I'm going to be watching the most on election night this year, the suburban counties surrounding our urban areas, our urban core counties. Why? Because in 2008, the suburban areas voted for Obama. In 2010, they went Republican. What happened in between? We had problems with unemployment and, of course, home foreclosures, which are very high. It's one of the reasons that Romney's coming to Pasco County, which it was one of the hardest hit counties financially. So in my business, you can't just look at politics. You've got to look at a lot of other things like culture and economics and just about every facet. Uh, the dean probably doesn't want me to say this, but I am so glad I teach political science and not calculus where you have to put the same thing on the board every day. I mean, it is never the same thing. I love calculus too, but I just don't want to teach it. So anyway, nonetheless. The other thing, I just have to tell you a great story. We saw the international journalists start pouring into our area, beginning with the GOP primary back in January. Remember after Newt Gingrich won South Carolina, all of a sudden Florida became the epicenter again for the GOP. It was a great opportunity for a lot of international journalists to come here and take a look at, at the area, knowing they were going to be coming back in August to attend the convention, representing every country in the world practically. And there were two things that they had in their mind about Florida that just aren't true. And one is that everyone in our state is over 95 years of age. <laughs> and we're going to see that's not true, even though I certainly hope I can live to 95. But the second is that every uh, Latino in our state is Cuban and Republican. And really, none of those are true anymore, and it happens so quickly. But if you don't study demographics and constantly up look, take a current look at how, where people are in Florida and whatever, you miss Florida altogether. And uh, I'll get back to that a little bit. We are the most competitive state. Florida is the only big state that's a swing state. California, New York, solidly Democrat. Texas, solidly Republican. You won't see the candidates in any of those states unless it's to have a fundraiser, but they won't have public events. There's no use. They're here in a competitive swing state. We have a lot of big uh, donors in our state, both Republicans and Democrats. At the end of the election, you can bet when they're listing who were the five states that had the most contributions to Democrats, Florida will be on that list, and the same for Republicans. And we are a deep pocket state. We're a very big contributor, um, and we got lots of sugar daddies and sugar mamas in our state. But I think one of the things that you really see emphasized this time out is we have 10 media markets, and some states only have one or two. Why is this significant? It's because when you're a candidate, and you're trying to decide where to put an advertisement, you look at it from the perspective of TV markets. Because if you are on the air in a market, you're reaching a whole lot of people. And it's also why it costs $1.8 million right now to keep an ad up in every market in Florida for just one week. So I know that you're thrilled to know that already $150 million has been spent on TV ads in Florida. And making us in Ohio the, to the top two states on that front. Here's our 10 media markets, as you can see here. And what is interesting, if you didn't know it, you're sitting in the largest one. People have the impression it's South Florida, but the Tampa Bay media market has 24% of all of our state's registered voters. And then if I go over here to Orlando, the 24 plus 13 uh, percent, uh, you can see 24 plus 19, 43 percent of all of Florida's registered voters live in the, the I-4 corridor. That's why it's become such a powerhouse politically. We call it fondly in our business the highway to political heaven or the other place if you lose. But nonetheless, it's what every journalist in the country and internationally is studying. They all come here to Florida. They do an I-4 corridor uh, story. Uh, I can say it by heart, but they all are really interested in it, and it is absolutely critical, and it's why they come here all the time. And in contrast, if I add Miami plus Palm Beach, it's only 32%. Because what you're looking at is registered voters, not population. And that's a, a mistake a lot of people make is to look at population instead of who can actually vote. 
and you'll see that that's what that is. We're very close, 4% difference only between Democrats and Republicans. A lot of people think this is a Republican state, but we've never had a majority of Republicans uh, as registered voters. This is a fascinating chart here because there's been absolutely so much nonstop attention on the Latino vote in Florida. What has sort of gotten lost in the transla translation is the fact that the, the black vote is almost the same size as the Latino vote. It's just that the black vote and Caribbean blacks now, as well as African Americans, you can no longer just use one term or the other, or really both very relevant in our state. But it's because the black vote is so solidly democratic that it's not really sought after as much as the, the Latino vote, which is growing. And of course, here's the age makeup. Uh, it is very interesting to see that we have almost an even age divide. We have 53% uh, over age 50 and 47% under, which is a far cry from everyone thinking everyone here is a senior voter. And what you'll see is actually the senior vote, which is the blue, the 65 and over, is 26%. The baby boomers are 27, but look at the largest age cohort is actually the 30 to 49 year olds. Now here's my read on this election early on. It's going to be a generational divide. If Obama can get the same share of younger voters, which are heavily still with Obama, to the same proportion of the electorate that occurred in 08, he will win Florida. If Florida's share of the electorate this time is older, is trending more Republican, then Romney will probably carry Florida. So we're starting to see, as always, Florida kind of a leading indicator for social developments that we see nationally. You begin to see the, the uh, generational divide really playing out in politics. And isn't it interesting how short a time period ago did we see that the most solidly Democratic voting bloc in Florida was seniors? Absolutely the opposite is true now. The most solidly voting Democratic voting bloc are the 18 to 29 year olds. Very, very interesting. But again, uh, Florida just being the, the leading indicator of what's happening nationally, especially on age. And you'll see here one of the reasons why the Medicare issue has not planned, played out as many Democrats nationally had anticipated, more, not so much Democrats, but news reporters. When it was announced that Paul Ryan was the VP, everybody said, oh, Florida is 100% going to go Democrats because the senior vote is going to lean in that direction. <coughs> well, if we hadn't been doing this kind of constant analysis, and let me tell you, Putting together the statistics that the state division of election gives us is a monumental task. My two students will attest to it. But isn't it interesting that Florida's senior vote is really very split, 42% Republican and 41% Democrat, and you know almost uh, 15, 16% something other than the two parties. So what we've seen happen is the Medicare issue has not pushed public opinion nearly as much as people outside of Florida had anticipated. And what happens, older voters tend to stick with their party. And because of the non-stop ads on Medicare on television, which are confusing, one set of ads says one statistic, another, another, what you see is older voters sticking with their party that they've been loyal to over the years. And so the Medicare issue is really not playing out as anticipated. But again, the relevance of age-based research in our state is very starkly clear. Now, of course, women rule. We all know that. <laughs> women make up 53% of Florida's electorate. That's a trend that's national. Women turn out at a higher rate. It was interesting that the last election cycle, for the first time, Latina, Hispanic women, turn out at greater rates than Hispanic men. It's always been true of uh, black women more than black men, and the same for whites. If you look at this chart here, you'll see that uh, women in Florida are about 10% more likely to be registered as, as Democrats. Males a little bit more as Republicans. And then, this is what my class loves when I have to give this, the first time I gave it, gender unknown. Now you might say, what is gender unknown? Now you teach college students, you get some great answers, such as both or undecided or, you know, whatever else. 
But I showed this to them to, to teach them about the fact that sometimes the way government keeps statistics is a little strange. And it's not required that you put down your gender when you register to vote. So we have an unknown category in Florida. And uh, well, it's just fun. What can I say? <laughs> If you had any doubts about the I-4 corridor being the predictor of Florida's outcomes, just take a look at this graphic here. This is how closely it tracks with the state at large. I mean, going back to 2000, 2004, 2008, as the I-4 corridor goes, so goes Florida. There's absolutely no sign that that's going to change one bit this time. The proof is in the pudding. Where are the candidates going? Orlando, Tampa, Tampa, Orlando, occasionally to Jacksonville and then down south. But we are the epicenter of this presidential battle. And if you had any doubts about that, look at the party makeup. The I-4 corridor, the Orlando plus Tampa media markets, 38% Democrat, 38% Republican. And then the rest are independents. So we have a, a little bit higher than state average uh, independent vote as well, NPAs, et cetera, which again, uh, those undecided votes that we were talking about, the dean says he's won, but I don't know. But I'll give him the, uh, the credit. But it's mostly younger people. No, no offense there, dean, but it's mostly younger people that are, are no party affiliation. Uh, anyway, they're, they're the swing voters a lot this time. Certainly, one of the common statistics that every analyst looks at is how people feel about the direction of the country. And there are some great websites out there, Real Clear Politics. I know probably if you're a political junkie, you go there about every 16 times a day like the rest of us. But they do great trend line analysis. And this one, of course, stopped on uh, the most current data, which was uh, October 21st. I pulled it off this morning. And you'll see right now only 40% of Americans think that the country's headed in the right direction as opposed to 55 who say it's on the wrong track. So it goes to that cynical mood of the electorate that we talked about earlier. Not un particularly unusual, again, when you have an economic downturn and people are really kind of very protectionist in what they want done both internationally as well as domestically. Every so often, a couple, every couple weeks or so, the Gallup people ask an open-ended question of about 1,200 people nationally about what is the most important ish problem facing this country. And then they, they aggregate them. And you can see that when you add them up, 72% of Americans say something economic. Unemployment and jobs, I haven't seen a poll since the recession hit that doesn't show the economy as number one. And then number two is uh, the economy in general, or unemployment is number one, economy in general, the budget deficit third, and lack of money and taxes and so forth. The deficit is a bigger problem in Florida. We first noticed this in research that we did, that's my students and I, in the 2010 election cycle where we were asked to write a book chapter and a major book on the Tea Party in Florida. And I was out interviewing a lot of the, the Tea Party, who were a lot of retirees. And one of the things that they kept telling me over and over, the Tea Party, by the way, in Florida, is not like it is nationally, just a little FYI. But what was really shocking to a lot of seniors in our state was suddenly, in the depths of the recession, they were getting a call from their adult children that they thought were long out of the nest, asking for money because they had lost their job or you know whatever, and they were they couldn't make their house notes or whatever else. It was a really shocking thing, and so the deficit still is a little bit larger issue here than it is in other places. And I love graphs. This is a good one. You see, this is when people would say the the economy is a big issue. But look at 07, the recession hits, and it's never slowed down in terms of the major issue that people are citing. Everybody agrees pretty much this is the worst recession we've had uh, and more severe than others. Not surprising there. And who do they blame? Washington. No surprise there. Do you believe the US is still in a recession? Absolutely. Here's a really important disconnect, because the government says we're not in a recession technically if you're an economist, but the people feel it and they don't believe it. And so you have that kind of statistical disconnect between government 
and people who are judging it on the basis of their daily lives. We've seen some parity about how do you deal with this deficit issue. Is it better to cut spending or is it better to reduce the deficit? A little bit more on the side of cutting spending, it would be the reverse if this was a Florida specific poll. And lest we doubt that Americans do get the fact that we have a global economy, this is a very good example of data that clearly shows that people way back even when there was talk of the Euro collapse kind of got the idea that if something happened there it would certainly affect our economy. But do they want to bail out any other countries? Absolutely not. And again, this is the example of the protectionist tendency that we see in people when it looks like you know, they would rather see money spent at home for people suffering in the United States. One of the big issues that's come up this time is an us versus them kind of a lot of private sector workers who have been more likely to lose their jobs look at government workers as on a gravy train and having an easier street. And so you see a little bit of that. And of course, they, the impression of people is that government workers make more and have more security in their pensions and so forth. Now, every presidential candidate has one statement they would like to take back. <laughs> and for the president, it was the one about small businesses. And so consequently, you can see the importance of a big media event in July when the statement was made, when you asked, you know, is it really people who start small businesses responsible for their success, or is it, you know, the government, of course, more people said the small businesses. And now you can see how that's playing out in a lot of congressional races and presidential races where the small business, by the way, America has a nostalgia for small businesses and troops. Those are the two things that you consistently kind of see on that front. This is a great slide here because it really does show the importance of how you word questions and the feelings of Americans about wealth. And you ask here, um, the statement which they were asked to agree or disagree with is what the first statement, I admire people who get rich by working hard. America really loves that. 88% of Americans say yes. Take the word out working hard and you get an absolutely opposite of viewpoint about wealth in this country. It's interesting. I just like that kind of thing. Uh, here I'm going to get into a few slides that give you a quick feel for what everyday people are thinking about everyday issues that hit their, their families and so forth. This one is very, very disturbing because it hits the younger generation much more intently than older generations when you ask people do they think that people who work hard in America make more money? And you know, this, we, don't, we haven't seen the negativity that we're seeing right now in these kinds of, of questions. But if I divided that into age groups, it would be definitely much, much higher among younger and particularly among college students who are facing not too great opportunities when they get out. Do people want wealthy people tax more? Yes. I think that's a pretty good example of that. Um, but on the other hand, uh, do we think that there's too much dependency upon government? And this is the entitlement question and it's, it's really very market. And I have to share with you some of the new research that we've gleaned this election cycle that is quite very different than what we've seen in the past. The, middle, the lower middle class working person is really the target and it has been from day one of this election from both parties. Here's how this group of people looks at other ends of the spectrum. They look at wealthy in America and they're thinking, what does government do for them? Great, everything. Tax breaks, access through PACs, whatever. So relative to the wealthy, they think government is helping the wealthy more than they're helping them. But here's the new part. They look over at the poor in America and they see a dichotomous group. Two, group, two groups. One, the legitimate poor. Second, the scammers. And this is really new because that group which heavily voted for Obama in 08 is swinging a little bit more towards Romney and this is why you have to understand why that's happening is this working class person who's barely making ends meet is very resentful of others who don't work but are no, not doing so for a legitimate reason. So this is just a, a new development we've seen. This is not good news for Florida. Most people think it's going to take at least three years for the housing market to recover. Another statistic you heard 
mentioned sort of tangentially in the foreign policy debate the other night, slippage of America's role in the world as the economic leader. Uh, we still have some slippage there. Is America as a stronger or weaker nation than it was four years ago? Twice as many people say weaker as say uh, stronger. And are America's best days behind us or ahead? In almost every election cycle up to this year, we've seen that people are more optimistic about the future. But it goes back to the cynical mood. We're just not seeing that this election cycle. In terms of security and military spending, a lot was about that in the debate the other night. Uh, most people think it's just about right. But you do see a little bit more saying not enough is too much, but the story is most people think it's about right, which is why that issue hasn't gotten a lot more traction than we had anticipated. You know this one, if I asked you this and you were candid, most people today don't think their children are going to be as well off as they are. Never in the history of polling have we seen numbers like this in this country. This is really a monumental shift in the optimism versus pessimism. And you see it play out here. Are there career opportunities for young people worse or better than they were four years ago? About the same, my, over half, almost 60% say worse. So looking ahead here real quickly, those of you who remember your days of statistics, regression analysis, I know that's just putting all of you at right wanting to go back to school again, but uh, you can see here, this is really, I think, an important lesson about this election cycle, and that is compared to, to even race, education, income, religiosity, or gender, nothing is a better predictor of how people are thinking about politics and how they're going to vote than their party affiliation. And that explains a lot of the polarization that we're seeing in this country. And when you ask people not how they're registered to vote, but what do they think of themselves as, you start to see more and more people disenchanted with the Republicans and the Democrats and choosing an independent. What are the two worst words in politics? Tea Party and liberal. And that's uh, just an interesting slide here. I think this is really where we're at with this election. If you understand this, you understand the 2012 election in a nutshell. The question is, which of these is closer to your point of view? Government should do more to solve problems and help meet needs of people, or government is doing too many things that are better left to businesses and individuals. Look at the stark partisan divide. Those in favor of a stronger role for government, Democrats 75%, Republicans 76% in favor of less role of a government and more individuals. And pretty much the independents kind of split. That's really, honestly, where we're at right now in this election. Now, I have to ask you this. So we ask every, you know, every four years, are these the best two candidates? No. This is one question that never changes. <laughs> we're never satisfied with the candidates, but you know what? We adjust. <laughs> and of course, uh, we've really seen a lot of this negative about too much money in politics. 80% of Americans say they'd like to see less of it in politics. But they don't like the media much anymore, and I have to say this is another really sea change since the last election. Americans are tremendously down on the news media. Here you see that over half think a reporter would like to tip the, the balance in favor of one candidate rather than focus on um, a more objective look. The level of distrust in the media, 60% negative, never have we seen that. If you want to explain polarization in America, all you have to do is understand the three cable networks in this country. They're ideologically divided. They're business. Each of them has figured out a niche market. If you tell me that you watch MSNBC religiously, uh, I know you're probably not a conservative, and vice versa on the Fox end of things. So if we look at MSNBC, clearly liberal, Fox, clearly conservative, who's that leave in the middle? CNN. CNN. Which which of these three networks has the lowest viewership? CNN. CNN. There you go. All right, and again, who do you trust more these days in terms of, of campaign information? This is why you're getting those calls from people you know, and Facebook friending and all that, because people trust people they know much more than they trust news anymore, which relates to the lack of things. So then we get down to the M&M question, and it's not real sweet, actually. But what do people consider the worst problem and the worst, in a way, contaminant of American politics? Is it money or is it media? And you'll see here just generically media bias wins out by a slight 5%, but pretty split. 
But isn't it fascinating that when you separate out opinions by the media or the, the uh, political elite, which I guarantee many of you in here are, if you give money to campaigns and you watch things and so on and you contact a Congress member or whatever, you're a political elite. You see, two-thirds of the political elite in this country think this huge problem is, is money. Now, there's a good reason why, because those are the ones most likely to get it hit up for money all the time, seriously. <laughs> but it is troubling also. Uh, this, per But yet, for the mainstream voter, it's media bias. And so that gives you a little bit of insight. Now, I want you to fix this. We're getting to the end here, I promise. This is the congressional job approval. We've actually had a little bit of an uptick on occasion. At one point this summer, it was 9%. <laughs> it is, as of the most recent one, because they recessed, was in September, it was 14% approval rating. This is critical because when people hate government, it's Congress that they hate. You have to understand that, and it'll make more sense in the slide down the way here. And when asking people whether they like to get rid of the whole Congress <laughs> or keep them, 68% said toss them all out. And I do expect that we're going to have some upsets. We've already seen a big upset of a longtime incumbent uh, Congress member up around the Gainesville area. He was beaten by a first-time large animal veterinary and a first-time candidate. And it was very interesting. I love ads. My students will attest. I, I love to teach about ad construction. The ad that was run on television that was the end of the incumbent Congress member was a bunch of pigs slurping at a trough. And keep in mind, that's the Gainesville area, whatever. And on every frame of the ad, it just listed how long that person had served in Congress. And out the door he went. Longevity in office is not something you put on your resume this cycle, if you're running for office particularly. And what if this has yielded, the gridlock in Congress has made Americans suddenly want one party co to control it all. Because historically, we like to have divided government. We like to have one house of the, you know, one party and so forth. But not now, because nothing's getting done in Washington. So here's why the race is close. Now I want to go back again. Look at this. The animosity in Washington is towards Congress far less so for the president. The president has never been viewed as negatively as Congress. And you'll see how close it is. The job approval, this was as of this morning, 49.5% approved, 46.8% disapproved. Again, a divided America on the presidential performance, but not any consensus like on Congress. So here's another thing, this is why even in a foreign policy debate the other night, the candidates ended with economics because they know that ever since we've been taking polls after the recession, that's what's mattered most. And they, for a long time, weren't convinced either one of them had a better answer on the issue than they themselves. This is key to understanding this election, especially in Florida. You see here that the older uh, cohorts nationally and in our state as well. Trust Republicans, Romney more on the economy. And you can see what I was talking about, about the younger generation being the most solidly democratic, definitely more in touch with and believing in the president. Now we have a Senate race, you'd never know it sometimes, but occasionally some ads. It was the only, I've been covering politics for News Channel 8, for, this is my 20th year as a, their analyst. And I went to both conventions, and I went to the Charlotte Convention, and it, it was the most shocking thing I've ever seen in my professional life. We have what, at the beginning of this year, was estimated to be the most interesting and most expensive U.S. Senate race in the country. So what were the Florida Democrats talking about in Charlotte? The governor's race in 2014 and whether Charlie Chris was going to become a Democrat or not. It was just an unbelievable thing, but our, our Senate race just hasn't gotten a lot of attention. The race is close. It shows you where we're at right now. A Romney nationally up by 0.8%. It doesn't get any closer than that. And uh, this is where we're at right now, today. That's the latest uh, statistics. And here's Florida. Uh, right now, Romney up in Florida by 1.8%. And uh, again, anybody can win. It's all who's going to get their people to the polls. The one thing I feel very proud, again, about our research at USF 
Many pundits nationally were writing about the fact that the debates weren't going to matter any. We knew better here because we've studied elections for a long time in Florida, and we knew that the last three election cycles, debates have mattered a lot to Florida voters. And sure enough, we see that if there's, you know, that, that the first debate moved public opinion more than any debate, and everybody else was even then writing it off, but not us in Florida, we knew better. And you can see even how the debates very quickly have evened out the favorability ratings of Romney with Obama because for such a long time, Obama had such a lead in terms of the favorability. So what do we still not know? We've got one more economic report that's coming out next Friday, just right before the election. We still don't really know about those people who say they're independent, so they tend to switch back and forth. In fact, the movement in the polls is pretty much them back and forth. The ad saturation, this is my biggest question as a researcher, has all of the oversaturation of Florida's television and the negative tone, is it going to drive turnout among key, key uh, dem demographic groups, specifically young, Hispanic, and women voters? And it's still not late, too late for one of them to make a real mistake. The one comment that, the, you know, that uh, Romney wishes he could take back, of course, the 47%. Yeah. So each of them has something they'd like to take back, and they're just keeping their fingers crossed they don't make any other mistakes between now and then. Is it going to be likability or is it anybody but? This relates to the enthusiasm thing. Every four years, whoever, whichever party does not have the White House is the most enthusiastic for voting. And I know there's a lot of Democrats in the room because I see many people that I've known for years and I know your politics. And the point here is that even four years ago, there was a tremendous anybody but a Republican mindset among Democrats because Republicans had control of the White House for eight long years. So you see a little bit of that. Accuracy of the polls all over the place. Polls have become a proliferation. They're a business at the end of the election. Somebody's not going to get much business next time out and somebody's going to get a lot. But just to give you context, in 08, the two most accurate polls in Florida and nationally were Rasmussen and Pew, the Pew Research Center. So we don't know if they'll still be. What I worry about is the last one here, a contested election. The realistic thing is that it's well underway. Both, te both parties have their legal teams in place. It just won't be about Chad's this time. It will be about the integrity of the election system. The one side is looking at things, changing the voting laws, particularly early voting and the ex-felon issue if it's a contested election. The other side is pointing to the fraud in terms of ineligibles on the registration rolls and actually having cast ballots. We have enough evidence on both sides to make it just arguably and both sides have had court cases related to each of these. I have a piece coming out in the New England Journal of Political Science and I'm really angry at them because they told me they'd be out in October and everybody wants it but it's a complete look at the whole collision course that Florida could be on if we have uh, a contested election, which I would expect will happen if Florida is only a 1% state and if we're once again the state that's going to make the difference in who wins the White House. Let's all hope it doesn't happen. It would be the worst thing for this country regardless of your politics and certainly would absolutely bring a halt to the little uh, improvement in the economy that we are starting to see. Libya, uh, again, people do expect that that will uh, hurt the president, though, but uh, we don't know yet. The polls, never trust a poll the day after a debate, wait five days. It takes a while for things to gel in people's minds. Now, after all this negativity, I find this the most refreshing thing about democracy, the fact that regardless of all this, Americans in general still think that it matters who's going to be president of the United States. But it is important to look at the enthusiasm gap in the closing days of the campaign. If you're an Obama supporter, these are the two trend lines that you're most disturbed about. The fact that Hispanic and young people's interest in the election has gone down a bit. And uh, if you're a Republican, you have to worry a little bit that the independents are, are a little bit iffy this time out for you. So who's going to win? It really does turn out to be whoever has the best ground game, as we say. 
We won't know, but we'll have a better idea this weekend because this is the weekend early voting starts in Florida, and a very, very important signal will be what we call the souls to the polls. Does everybody know what that is? It's the, where black voters are bused from churches or you know, encouraged to go from church to vote at the polls. And if black turnout is high and the enthusiasm's high, and then as soon as early voting starts, young vote is up, that's a good sign for Obama. And uh, that'll be a good sign that the organization of the Democrats is really on target. If either of those slip, and if we see a bit of a slip in turnout among the Puerto Ricans on the other end of I-4, that will be a bad sign for the president. So we're looking at a lot of different things, but it's still a tie. And um, I just have to end with one thing, and that is um, two things, actually. Thank God I'm not a political scientist in North Dakota, but at USF, for starters. <laughs> and I've seen so many friends here tonight that I've known over the years. It's so nice to be invited to give this presentation. I have a wonderful dean, and I certainly love the Bulls, even though I am a Seminole, so um, yeah. that's okay. You always love your alma mater. That's a good thing, too. But I have to reflect back when I first got, it in, got into the public speaking and so forth. I'll never forget an older gentleman in the back of the room raised his hand and he said, he asked this question, he said, Honey, you know how it was, <laughs> I just got to ask you one thing. And I said, Sure. He says, What is a nice girl like you doing in politics? <laughs> I still don't know the answer. So thank you very much. Thank you.